Welcome to Riverside Baptist Church. We're delighted to have you here to worship with us this morning. We've got a lot of things going on uh, as we begin to our worship service this morning. A lot of things we want to make you aware of. First is, if you're a special guest, there is a first-time guest, there's a card in the pew in front of you. looks like this. If you'll take a moment to uh, fill that out and hand it to me as the door behind you uh, as you leave this afternoon. This afternoon, I'm, I'm not going to preach that long, trust me. Uh, as you leave this morning out the door behind you, uh, we have a goodie bag that we'd like to give you. It has some information about our church, and it's a way of just saying thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning. They are hand-picked items from our pastor. Uh, so we, he likes it, so we think you'll like it too. Uh, so make sure you stop by and, and get that from me this morning. Speaking of our pastor, he is on his sabbatical. Uh, he hopes to, he's supposed to be flying back in next week from Texas. Um, I'm worried about him, though, because he keeps saying he's moving to Texas. <laughs> and he keeps saying that he's going to have Ethan come with him. And I don't think that's going to be a pretty sight between uh, Stephanie and uh, his other grandmother. Uh, so uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, he has not seen any snakes, but he did find a llama, he said, which surprised him. And uh, so he's doing well. We were able to uh, talk with him the other day and actually were able to... Um, FaceTime him and uh, Phyllis, and he sent back this picture. He got to meet Phyllis uh, while he was down in Texas. Uh, for those of you who don't know, she had moved down there with some of her family to help take care of her. Uh, he delivered the car. She was overjoyed with that and so appreciative of the love and uh, that you have been sending her and continue to pray for her uh, as she's down in Texas now. So I wanted to uh, share that with you. Uh, and. Uh, let you know about that. We were able to FaceTime with her. Uh, we were in Asheville, the pastor's in Texas, and we were able to get together for a little bit and just uh, talk to each other. So it was a good time. Uh, she seems to be doing really well. And uh, like I said, I appreciated all the cards and the love and prayers that you continue to offer up for her. As you remember, we're still in our 31 day challenge in the book of Proverbs. I hope you're up to date. Today is the 19th, so we should be reading chapter 19 at some point today. Uh, if you're not caught up, catch up. Or just start where we are today. And uh, we'll be looking more in uh, the book of Proverbs uh, during our uh, time of uh, worship this morning. Uh, don't forget the VBS sign up in the hallway behind the stairwell. We also uh, have the WMU uh, Missions Conference will be taking place at Glencoe on uh, March 21st at 6.30 is when it starts. There's some uh, flyers on the tables you can take with you, invite some friends and neighbors to go to that. It'll be a good event for our WMU. Also, the Young at Heart is having a fun and game night, um, Saturday, March 25th at 6 o'clock p.m. Uh, sign up for that is also in the, uh, in the hallway over here uh, behind the stairwell. So make sure you sign up for that. And then while you're doing that, you can sign up to help in Bible school and help us out with that. As we uh, continue this morning, I want us to uh, uh, want to remind you about our love offering. We extended it from last week. Those of you that weren't able to be here last week with all the snowfall that we had, uh, we wanted to extend it just to make sure everybody had an opportunity to help uh, Siloam Missionary Home. Uh, they had an emergency uh, cost come up. A drain pipe has busted, causing a sinkhole in their parking lot. Uh, insurance is not gonna cover it. So we wanted to help them out with this unexpected cost. So anything that goes into the charcoal buckets uh, at all the doors uh, that says love offering on it goes to Siloam Missionary Homes. Uh, if you write a check and put Salon Missionary Homes on it and it ends up in the blue bucket, it will get put into uh, the gray and counted to go to them. Uh, the blue bucket is our uh, normal uh, tithes and offerings and anything for our North American missions. If it's marked for that, it'll go to that. So just want to make you aware of that this morning. And I wanted to thank you for your generosity. Uh, last week, we had a, a, a lot of generosity shown for our love offering for our North American missions. I was unable to get the actual count so I could start lighting up some of the lights so you could see. Uh, our goal is to try to have it lit for our pastor before he comes back from sabbatical for our uh, home North American missions offering that we're taking up for Annie Armstrong. Uh, our goal this year is $58,000. And uh, not 58,000. <laughs> I would love for us to be able to get 58,000. Uh, I, I think I inherited the pastor's uh, math abilities and uh, capabilities. Um, anyway, $5,800 is our goal uh, for uh, Lottie, this, uh, for Annie, this 
uh, Easter offering. That's $116 a light, and uh, I've got to get with Donna and see where we are. So uh, hopefully tonight I'll be able to light some of those lights. So if you want to see where we are, you need to come back here tonight uh, to see that uh, and see where we're at. But as we're talking about, I wanted to show you a little bit of what the North American missions is all about. You might think, well, I passed 10 churches just to get here. Why do we need missionary work here in North America? Well, as you see on this slide, there are 371 million people, roughly, in North America. That represents 350 languages, and it, there is an estimated 281 million lost in North America. So the need is great. And part of that is our goal is uh, 5,800, and I wanted to show you uh, but before I show you a video of how some of that's being used in North America, on the tables there are the prayer guides uh, to help you pray for our North American missions, and there's also some envelopes uh, if you want to use those to give uh, to that. But let me show you this video and let you see what is going on in uh, North America through you. When people say keep Portland weird, you can think oh, people there want nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the gospel, but there are so few evangelicals in the city that uh, that curiosity is like you're this exotic creature. Most people have never met a pastor before, and so you're definitely the minority if you are a Christian. Gresham Bible Church was the first church I planted. We developed lots of deep meaningful friendships with people in that community, and our kids did as well. But three years ago, the Lord made it clear to us that there were other communities in Portland that needed a new healthy church. This particular area of Northeast Portland is what you might call a, a church desert. And we were excited to follow the, the call of God, but worried about how our kids would take the news. Yeah, I was not thrilled that we were moving. Like, one of the big things that we had been praying for when we moved here was that I could find some friends in this neighborhood, and I found a lot, so that's really nice. We put ourselves out there in all kinds of ways with neighbors and with people who heard about this new church getting started, and it is all hands on deck for the Brown family in this church plant. It's been a while since I went to church and just sat and listened instead of doing stuff during it, but it's nice to be able to help. We've got to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ grow. We've seen leaders raised up and missionaries sent out from our church because the need for gospel access in this city is really great. We started this church believing the Lord would provide and they've got to see, wow, God gave us a building and God brought people and, sorry, it's gonna make me cry. They get a front row seat, you know, to see the Lord provide and it's been really awesome really awesome. And as you give, you are a part of sending those out to reach those in basically a church desert. Uh, we don't really think about that being here. We can throw a stone in about hit a church. Uh, and, uh, but we don't think about there being actual places in America where the gospel is not even being uh, uh, the ability to be given out. So please pray for how you want to be generous in giving to North American missions. 100% of that goes to missionaries on the field um, and keeping them there. So uh, please help us keep that in mind as we uh, continue our emphasis in North American missions. Um, as I said, don't forget your prayer guides. Pray for our North American missions. If you can't give financially, pray for them. That's even better. Uh, that'll help them and help us have a connection with them and be part of their work. Now I'm going to ask Serenity if she'll come now and do our scripture reading for today. Our scripture reading for today comes from Proverbs 18, 1, 2. As you are able, please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. One who isolates himself pursues selfish desires. He revels against all sound wisdom. A fool does not delight in understanding, but only wants to show off his opinions. May God bless this reading of his word to our understanding and application. Please be seated.
Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you with humble hearts and open arms, just pleading for your mercy to be shown upon us. Lord, this past week we were fortunate, me and Stephanie, to be at a conference and to hear beautiful worship and, and scriptures being taught. And Lord, as we were sitting there and singing and thinking about it, we know that our sins, they are many, but your mercy is more, Lord. And we thank you for that. Lord, as we come now, we pause. We take away all the things that are out in our, in our minds that may be things we have to do, things we need to take care of after the service. Lord, help us to focus on you for the next few moments, to hear a word from you, guidance in how that we should approach the next few hours, the next few days, weeks. Lord, to see where you are working and moving, to guide and direct us. Lord, we pray for those that are hurting in our families, that are in the hospitals, that are struggling near the point of death. We just lift them up to you, Lord. We thank you for the praises that we've heard of recovery. And we put everything into your capable hands, the great physician. Lord, help us to not try to guess and understand your will, but to accept it and to know that it's in your nurturing arms that we can flourish and survive. Lord, in these next few moments, may our worship be glorifying to you, and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory this morning. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Before we stand and sing, I have a special prayer request. Most of you know that Don Patterson has some heart issues. <laughs> he had a very bad night last night, chest pains and left arm pains. Uh, took an unusually high amount of pain medicine to get him to calm down, but he was awake all night. So Linda called me this morning and said that early this morning he was able to start getting some rest, so they're, they're at home. He does have an appointment with his cardiologist tomorrow, so I need you to be in prayer for him. Uh, I appreciate you. Stand as we sing. We have heard the joyful sign. <laughs>
like you to stand and sing with us. <clears throat> sing blessed be the name we'll get the words up and we'll start in just a second <laughs> We part of the family that's been born again. Part of the family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made. Yeah. 
family. And I think I have experienced all of those things this week, the sadness, the happiness, the crying with other believers. Uh, all of that has taken place. And it appears school might be out. I think we have a ghost in the machine this morning. Uh, I warned the pastor when he left, if I kept having technical difficulties, he might come back to a primitive Baptist church. That's where we have no electronics, and we only uh, have our voices to uh, do anything. But uh, anyway, we are continuing our journey through the book of Proverbs. I hope you are finding it uh, enjoyable and uh, eye-opening, uh, as I am. Uh, when I first was thinking about this, I wasn't sure, and I couldn't convince the pastor that he should do it. So uh, while he's away, I decided I'd put my own ideas into implementation and we'll see what comes of it. 
But as we begin this morning, I want you to think back for a moment on all that has changed just in your lifetime, uh, be it technology, uh, scientific improvements, things like that. Think of how rapidly things have changed uh, as we've gone up. Uh, we were talking the other week, me and Stephanie, with our youth about the uses of phones just in our lifetime and how they progressed uh, all the way from the bag phones to now what's in our pockets and uh, everything in between. It's a great time to be alive because we have so many advances taking place, but it can also be a very anxious time for us in the world we live in. Uh, let's go back just a century uh, and see a world that we might not even recognize if we could go back 100 years. Uh, it's probably one we wouldn't recognize. It's probably one we really wouldn't want to live in, truth be told. Uh, if we did go back, we'd find a world with no penicillin, uh, no polio vaccine, no frozen foods, no copy machines, contact lenses, or even Frisbees. There'd be no credit cards, no uh, laser beams, no ballpoint pens even, no FM radios, no CD players, no computers, which might be a blessing, uh, no iPad or cell phones. Uh, now try to explain a smartphone to somebody from 100 years ago and see what kind of reaction you would get. Uh, they'd probably lock you up for going mad and being silly. The term chip to them would mean a piece of wood. Hardware meant hammer and nails. Software wasn't even a word. There really were five and dime stores where you could purchase items for a nickel and a dime. For a nickel, you could buy ice cream with sprinkles even. You could buy a soft drink for a nickel. You can make a telephone call in a telephone booth. Some of you will have to Google that to see what that is uh, because we don't have them anymore. Um, you could buy enough stamps to mail a letter and two postcards. Gas was 11 cents. Grass was something that you cut. Coke was a soft drink, not an illicit drug. Pot is something that you would cook in. And AIDS were helpers, not a disease. Yet yeah, things sure do change rapidly. We could all attest to that. But would we say today that we are any wiser or smarter? That's the question for us. Have we really learned anything over 100 years? Are we ready for what lies ahead? Are we ready to meet God? Well, every generation has the potential for good or for evil, uh, to live wisely or to play the fool. And if you truly look honestly around our world today, it's hard to be optimistic. It, it truly is. But sadly today, we too easily buy into the lies of the world. We too readily play the fool. Sadly, we have the mindset, Father, forgive us, for we know not what we are doing. And please, don't tell us. We disobey God's word because we think that our lives, our marriages, or our parenting situations are, are the exceptions to God's clear understanding and teachings. And when we do that, we show that we would rather live a lie than actually uh, and be like a fool than live out the truth. And Proverbs continually contrasts that for us, the wise with the way of the fool. The pattern continues here in Proverbs chapter 18, verses 1 through 9. Uh, with a description of the fool's antisocial nature, his activity, and his consequences. It, it is actually divided into three sections as we look at it this morning. And as we analyze these three movements, what does Solomon teach his son about the ways of the fool? In particular, what does he teach him concerning a fool's antisocial behavior, his words, and his work ethic? First, let's take a look at the fool's antisocial behavior. A fool in Proverbs is a person who lacks wisdom, and he's not able to see life from God's perspective and act accordingly. They're oblivious to the ways of God and refuse the counsel of true friends. The fool displays their lack of wisdom in three distinct ways. First, the fool, we see, isolates himself in verse 1. A fool is antisocial and a loner who is absorbed with himself. His interests are located in his own desires and self-gratification because he is self-centered. He doesn't listen to the sound wisdom of others. When, when others try to reason with him, uh, the, ESV, the ESV says he breaks out. In, in the uh, NIV, it says he starts a quarrel. 
And the CSB says that he rebels. The fool is a loudmouth who only causes trouble because he never listens to anyone. He's quick-tempered, rages emotionally out of control, and refuses to receive godly wisdom. Now, at this point in the sermon, I want to issue a word of caution. Don't start pointing or poking the person beside you as we go through this. Uh, it, it won't end pretty, I can tell you that. As I said last, uh, I think it was last Sunday night, when you point, there's three fingers pointing back at you. So be careful when you start to point. But as he is saying uh, this, a wise person is the opposite of what's been said so far. They will surround themselves with godly friends, those who love them enough to tell them the truth, even when it hurts. A lone ranger is not wise. And after all, the lone ranger wasn't alone. He had Tonto and needed him. Secondly, we discover that the fool is opinionated. Verse 2. It says that he does not delight in understanding, but only wants to show off his opinions. In other words, the fool has a closed mind, but an open mouth. He won't listen, but is quick to tell others what he thinks. Pride is alive and well in his soul. He's convinced that what he uh, thinks is what everyone else ought to think. My mama used to always tell me that the good Lord gave me two ears and one mouth, and I should use it accordingly. Uh, didn't always take that advice too well, but I believe that's what Solomon is getting at here in the scripture. Uh, James 1, 9 tells us, uh, 1, 19 says, provides, provides a very wise word of counsel for us here. It says, understand this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. We next see that the fool also will be humiliated because he lacks wisdom. Because he keeps to himself, he will not listen and he loves to hear the sound of his own voice. And because of that, he will eventually humiliate himself. In this instant, the, his foolishness leads him into wickedness. He's not a wise person, but a foolish person. He's not a good person, but a wicked person. His foolish choices eventually cost him, and they cost him big time. Three words describe the fool's humiliation here in the scripture. It says contempt, dishonor, and disgrace, or derision. These three go hand in hand, and the fool continues his own uh, path, and the consequences as he goes down them grow more and more severe. So let's look at uh, how a fool is loose with his words. We see that in verses 4 through 8. When you go to a doctor for a checkup, uh, one of the first things they do is they look at your tongue. Uh, I always thought that was strange, uh, but... I found out that the tongue is an indicator for the health of the body. You can look at the color, the shape, the, uh, the way it looks. I look at it, I just see a tongue. But the doctor is trained to look at it and see what's going on. And it's the same way. God says we should listen to what flows from your tongue because it's an indicator of your spiritual health as well. James 3.8 says that no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Proverbs continually speaks to the power and the importance of the tongue. And it does so again here in verses 4 through 8. Here the focus is specifically on the words that come bubbling out of the mouth of the fool. Now in verse 4, the fool, he does not delight, uh, he, he, um, he does not see the delight of his words. The verse contrasts the words of the fool with the words of the wise. The idea is that the words of the wise are a continuous supply of blessing and nourishing counsel. Deep waters are cool, pure, and refreshing. They bless and do not curse. They, they build up and do not tear down. They're like a beautiful flowing river or a fountain of wisdom. A contrast is implied here. A fool's words are stale, possibly bitter, potentially poisonous. They cater to the wicked. They stir up strife. They ruin lives and find a home with those who gossip. There's no delight to be seen in the fool's word. Next we see, as we go continue on, he does not see the disgrace of his words. Verse 5. Verse 5 places us in the context of a courtroom. The fool shows partiality to the guilty by perverting the justice of the, uh, due the innocent. 
He takes the side of the wicked against the righteous. His actions and words turn truth upside down, and it betrays the innocent. Your mind might immediately go to Jesus and the false witnesses who sided with the wicked and the powerful Sanhedrin against him. You see, the fool forgets or ignores the wisdom of Proverbs 19, verse 5. A false witness will not go unpunished, and one who utters lies will not escape. We now come down to verse 6, and we see that he does not see the danger in his words. The danger in his words. Has anybody in here ever heard of the Ten Commandments of Human Relations? I don't see anybody. Well, you're in luck. I'm going to share them with you. They are attributed to Robert Lee, who was a pastor of Bellevue Baptist in Memphis, Tennessee, from 1927 to 1960. And uh, the first commandment that he uh, said was, speak to people. There's nothing as nice as a cheerful word of greeting. Smile at people. It takes 72 muscles to frown, only four to smile. Number three, call people by name. The sweetest music to anyone's ear is the sound of one's name. Number four, be friendly and helpful. If you would have friends, be friendly. Be genuinely interested in people. You can like almost everybody if you try. If you can't, love them in Jesus. Number six, be generous with praise and cautious with criticism. Seven, be considerate with, feelings of, with the feelings of others. There are usually three sides to a controversy. Yours, the other person's, and the right one. Number eight, be alert to give service. What counts most in life is what we do for others. Number nine, learn to trust people. That trust will build relationships. And number 10, have a sense of humor. If you add to the above a good sense of humor, a big dose of patience, and a dash of humility, you will be rewarded manifold. Now, as you might expect, a, a, fuel, a fool will value none of the things that I just mentioned. He will not accept the wise counsel. Actually, as verse 6 says, a fool is good at talking themselves into trouble. A fool's lips lead to strife, and his mouth provokes a beating. Now, this, the, the message uh, puts it very colorfully this way. It says, the words of a fool starts fights. Do him a favor and gagging. A fool's words will push people over the edge, and he's the one who will pay the price. As my grandpa said, he deserves a tail whipping. As we move on down, we see that the fool, he, he does not see the destruction in his words. Verse 7. As we look at verse 7, it repeats the idea of verse 6, but it also advances the argument. The fool receives a beating in verse 6, but he is destroyed in verse 7. Now, words are powerful weapons, uh, and sometimes we use them to our own ruin and destruction. I wish it were true, the old saying, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Uh, sadly, that's not accurate, uh, in, especially in today's world. But the picture is of a man who lays a deadly trap for himself here, and he does so with his own lips, his own words. The fool is a man who cannot keep his mouth shut and ruins his life. This is a self-destructive nature to the words of a fool as he reaps what he sows. I'm reminded of some of those cop shows and YouTube videos that where the person just keeps talking and talking and they just keep digging the hole deeper and deeper and getting themselves into more and more trouble. And you're like, just stop talking and it'll be okay. Stop talking. But they just can't seem to stop and they continue. Well, Proverbs 10, 14 reinforces this truth for us. It says, the wise store up knowledge but the mouth of the fool hastens destruction. A wise person will never forget that a lifetime of building a good reputation can come crashing down and be destroyed with just one careless word. There are far more regrets for what we have said than for what we have not said. Jesus reminds us here in Matthew uh, chapter 12, verses 26 through 37, I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. 
this verse always brings to my mind that there's some kind of invisible tape recorder hanging around my neck that records everything that I say and do. And every time I use the word ought to somebody else, it records. And then I'm judged by what I say somebody else ought to do. And uh, I don't know why that pops into my mind, but it does as we continue on as looking at this. Lastly, we see that the fool, he does not see the disease in his words. Verse 8. Proverbs, 8, uh, chapter, uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 8, and chapter 26, verse 22, they're identical. Uh, they address the wicked and destructive sins of gossip. It's like a choice food that goes down to one's innermost being. The words become a part of us, of who we are. Uh, Roy Order, Ortland summarizes the matter of gossip well, and let me read you what he says. He says, let's all admit it. We love gossip. We love negative information about other people. We love controversy. We find it delicious. It's a delicious a delicacy to our corrupt hearts. We gulp these words down with relish, but the contagion then goes down into us, and it makes us a deep impression and leaves us even sicker than we were before. Truly, God is not mocked. Ray then goes on to raise some very good questions, and in the process puts every one of us on the spot this morning. He says, do you speak up when others are put down? Or do you just stand there and listen in sinful silence? God says, open your mouth. With every unkind word that goes unconfronted, a reputation dies. So much is at stake in our words. They matter not just to us, but even more, far more, to God. We are always speaking before the face of God. Once again, that comes back to my mind, that tape recorder. Some of you have a blank stare. You'll have to Google what a tape recorder is. Uh, I'm in that age and generation where I know some of the old stuff and some of the new. I'm in that middle. Uh, just ask your grandparents what a tape recorder is. They'll tell you. As we see this, we've seen how the fool lacks wisdom and is loose with his words. And lastly, I want us to look at that the, food is, the, the fool is lazy concerning work. Verse 9. Verse 9 concludes with this section, concludes this whole section with a quick and simple word about our work ethic. Walt Disney said that success is doing something so well that people will pay to see you do it again. Theodore Roosevelt said that far and away the best prize that life offers is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. Unfortunately, the Proverbs fool uh, is completely out of touch with these kinds of perspectives. The fool has no problem with shoddy workmanship or poor work ethic because he is a slacker. He is lazy concerning work because he is poor in his performance. <clears throat> a fool is lazy in doing his job or slacking his work. He's content to do just enough to get by. As long as he keeps his job, he does not care if he gets a poor performance review. He's not known as a hard worker, and he doesn't really care. He's not known as an honest worker either, and he doesn't care. He's not known... Uh, as a guy that goes above and beyond or will go the extra mile and he doesn't care. Colossians chapter 3 verses 23 through 24 calls the devoted follower of Christ to a different and to a higher mindset when it comes to work. Paul writes this, whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people. Knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord, you serve the Lord Christ. The fool also shows he's lazy concerning work by the fact that he keeps company with destructive partners. The fool's a slacker and is a brother to a vandal. Laziness and destruction are twins, two peas in a pod, so to speak. They are related and similar in nature. The one who is slack may look for shortcuts and may make things that fall apart. His destruction may be indirect and slow in coming, but it will come. Do you cut corners at work? Then you're a fool. Do you take shortcuts that reduce quality? Then you're a fool. You're selling uh, yourself short, neglecting the gifts that, and the abilities that God has given you by cheating others and potentially putting others at risk. When you realize that you work for a king who knows your name and sees everything you do, it will make a difference in how hard you work. 
and the quality of your work. He gave his best for you. Doesn't he deserve the same from you? Jesus Christ is the quintessential Proverbs man, the embodiment of the wisdom of God as we've been talking about the past couple weeks. He's also the antithesis for the fool. The fool lacks wisdom, but Jesus is full of grace and truth. Jesus wasn't isolated. He surrounded himself with friends and companions with whom he shared life. He was not opinionated, but spoke words of truth, healing, and grace. As John 7, 46 says, no man ever spoke like this. Now, it must be admitted that he was humiliated, but his humiliation was for our benefit. As he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He was dishonored and disgraced so that we would not have to be. And slack in his work? I don't think so. Not a chance. Not even a hint. John 4, 34 nails it. It says, uh, My food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. Praise God that Jesus finished the work that the Father gave him and finished it on the cross and declared it to be so when he said, It is finished. The wisdom of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, makes it possible for us to walk in wisdom and to not play the fool. And he's given us an invitation, an invitation to all of us. The question is, how will you respond to that invitation? How you respond is up to you. No one else can make that decision for you. Your grandparents, your parents, your uh, friends, neighbors, they can't make that decision for you. You must decide for yourself if you will accept the invitation of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to sing in just a moment during a time of response, Lord, I pray that we respond to your calling in our lives. Your invitation is open to all. All we must do is surrender to you. Will we put away self and truly sing, I surrender all? Lord, all to you I freely give. That's all you ask of us, is to give ourselves to you. To come to you humbly, seeking your direction and your will in our lives. As we sing these words in just a second, Lord, can we say, I surrender all. If you've never surrendered to the Lord, now's the time. If you don't know exactly what that means, come down, we'll be glad to share with you, talk to you, help you to understand it more and to know the true freedom that comes only in Christ. If the Lord's dealing with you this morning, you come as we sing. It's in your name that we pray, Lord. Amen. Please stand as we sing. Don't forget your imaginary tape recorder that just was recorded uh, on there. So uh, as we go out this week, remember that we surrender all to the Lord and to live for him. Uh, just a quick word. Remember to pray for Don, as uh, Keith has said, and continue to remember um, Doris Foster as she's in hospice. Um, and remember uh, James Pruitt. Uh, talked with Todd uh, before the service. He's doing better. Uh, but they're still going to keep him for a little while at the hospital, so continue to keep him in your prayers as we go out this week. And uh, continue to remember the Workman family in your prayers as well and the loss of uh, Scotty. So uh, let's uh, say our verse as we go out this morning. The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. 
Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Lord, we pray as we go out into the world that we will be there to help have those gospel conversations that will bring in the harvest and that we will be able to share with those around us more about how what it means to have a life with you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.